Okay, welcome everyone. <laughs> Today I have a truly inestimable honor, good I got that word out, yeah, <laughs> of having with us not only Sandra Sims, one of my favorite people in the whole entire world, a retired judge from here, <laughs> neither shy nor retiring in any mental, emotional, spiritual sense of the word, <laughs> a true truth teller, truth seeker, <laughs> and Dean Danielle Conway of Penn State Dickinson Law, <laughs> formerly of a whole bunch of places, which I'm gonna let you look up on her bio because I don't wanna take any time away from letting these two incredible women share their thoughts, their insights and perspectives. <laughs> so Sandra, do you have access to Danielle's letter? I do. I actually have it in front of me. And we thought that might be a good way to start this. Danielle, you don't, you don't want to read it? I was going to let you do that. Okay, I will read it then. I, I'm honored to read it. It, it. it just, I read it last, portions of it, and it just brought tears to my eyes, I'll tell you. <clears throat> this is a piece that Danielle wrote for the Dickens, uh, Dickinson School of Law community, and it ended up being published in the, um, I guess in the local papers in Pennsylvania uh, as an opinion piece, and it sort of spread around. And this is what she wrote. I will disclose to you what I am experiencing as a black woman living through a pandemic that is killing our brothers and sisters, and yes, disproportionately killing our black brothers and sisters. I will disclose to you what I am experiencing as a wife to an African man and mother to a black son, fighting the par par paralysis that handcuffs me when they leave my sight. I will disclose, disclose to you what I am feeling as a veteran who has served her country for 27 years because I am a patriot. But hearing a president discount me for my race and my gender, I will disclose to you what I am feeling as the daughter of a dead father who was a police officer who bled, bled blue and perpetrated many of the ills we rebuke in this very moment. I will disclose to you what I am experiencing as a black woman leading at Penn State Dickinson Law where students, staff, faculty and administrators are working at this very moment to act to support vulnerable members of our community. Today, I am a member of that vulnerable group. And while I would do anything to shield you from this pain, it is likely that you may one day be vulnerable too. I am exasperated, disconsolate, and infuriated by seemingly never ending acts of overt and covert racism as well as near impenetrable institutions in American society that build their foundations on the degradation of black bodies and psyches. Racism is an incessant malady and a scourge to all of humanity. In this way, not one of us is safe. All of this said, I stand on the right side of justice, knowing who I am and from where I come. I stand on the shoulders of my ancestors who are also your ancestors, the Emmett Tills, the Stephen Bicotes, the Polly Murrays, the Frederick Douglasses, the Ida B. Wells, and so on and on. I stand with allies who use their privilege to place a human shield between justice and injustice. I stand up and speak out knowing that it places me and my beloved family within the sights of those who have lost their humanity. I stand and persevere because to do otherwise would be to give up on humanity and the power and the promise of the rule of law. I disclose this last truth. I believe in each one of you and your individual and collective abilities to use this moment and the skills you are learning as law students to banish injustice, inequality, racism, and sexism. You are the reason I can compartmentalize my fears and bracket my breaking heart. We 
have the power to stop killing people. We have the power to stop weaponizing white privilege against black people. We have the power to protect black mothers from the constant assaults on their psyches that come from knowing their black sons' bodies can be snatched from their arms. We have the power to love one another, to respect one another, and to be decent to one another. We now need the will. I remain always in service to you, to my country, and to the rule of law. Please reach out to me for anything. I'm sorry. <laughs> me too, right? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> okay. Okay. What that letter does and what it makes me ask you, Danielle, and thank you so much. Um, my late grandfather from a small town in Northern Louisiana once said, tears are just the heart overflowing. Maybe that's a good thing. Yeah. What that letter I think does and leads me to ask you is how do we, as you did so eloquently in that letter, connect the vulnerability Sorry. and the humanity that should bond us, not divide us? Well, just what you did, it's to tap into each other's hearts and souls. And, mm -hmm. you know, I learned that absolutely completely in Hawaii, just the outpouring of love and respect for Ohana and to open yourself to vulnerabilities that many of which are not your own, but the vulnerabilities of others <laughs> and to tap into your authenticity and your honesty. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And those things are, are just fundamental for understanding how we regain and accelerate our humanity. How do we get people to share that authentically? I think the approach to use is to, to sit with yourself. I don't think we spend enough time sitting with ourselves. So when I wrote that, I had to really closet myself. Uh, I had my son in one room, I had my husband in another, and I had to literally go away from them so that they would not see me crying, uh, trying to get this out. And also knowing I had to speak to the community that I'm leading. You had to speak. I had you to. had to speak. I had to. And so I went somewhere by myself and really pondered each and every word of that letter because I had to tell them as a leader that I was vulnerable, that I was hurting, that I was scared, that I was angry, but I had to tell them in a way that they could feel hope toward the end of it, that they could help me. And I was fortunate in spending that time alone to actually believe what I was writing. Because if I didn't believe it, they would know. Is that the, it, I mean, it was, it was, I mean, it was easily to know that it was so deeply from your heart. I said, when I read it to Chuck last week, just, we just did a portion of it and, you know, I'm, I'm kind of, in, I'm kind of a mess here right now, but actually when I read it at home, I felt, I felt that, that intensity and what, and, and getting to Chuck's point, an important piece of it is also that you are in a position that you can share that perspectives. And that is one of the things that we actually can do, Chuck, being in those positions where you can bring that perspective and that viewpoint of, you know, a black woman, a lawyer, a mother, a wife, a veteran, and all the other, and all the other titles and things that we carry 
and helping people to understand that we're basically all in this together. We're talking to you, we're talking all human beings. We're not separate um, you know, from each other. We're all connected. And so the su su success of our society is gonna depend on all of us because we all wear all these different hats and different mm -hmm. perspectives. And it's important for us to see each other that way rather than just seeing you standing off in the corner as the dean, right. <laughs> you know, or right. uh, the lawyer or the judge or whatever position it is and not, uh, not allowing people to see past that. Right. To see past that wall that separates. Granted, we still have our roles to do and our things, things to carry out, but we're still human mm -hmm. and we're still human beings. And so mm -hmm. the humanity that we all share together has to come out. And, and the more we have situations that allow for that, like in what you've done, Chuck, what you're doing with this, with this program, mm -hmm. um, we have those situations and opportunities for people to share that humanity. I think it helps us to connect better uh, mm -hmm. and understand each other better and see each other as together. As in all of this, these things, right? All, are, in all of these things. We are yeah. made up of so many experiences and so many attributes. Yeah. We are not all just one thing. Yeah. No, none of us. None of us. None of us. Yeah. And I think yeah. one of the things, Danielle, that I especially want to thank you for, the first two people in the world that I sent your letter to when I read it. My daughter mm -hmm. in Boston, my son here to share with their children wow. and to talk to them about it, mm -hmm. what it means, where it comes from, to give those families, those children the chance to connect their vulnerability to their humanity, to each other. Because maybe you have the heart of the matter. Maybe it is through our vulnerability, mm -hmm. acknowledged, respected, honored, understood, that we can best connect with each other. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. no better place to have this letter land than in Hawaii with so many people I consider family who nursed me through so many uh, uh, miscarriages and finally to come up with my son born at Kapiolani Women's and Children. I remember. And we, yeah, and we call him the last egg because that's true. He was <laughs> the last egg. <laughs> Mine too. Right? And all of you got me through that. And so what better place than this letter to wind up as, as in a figurative letter in a bottle? A lot of that was a love letter to Hawaii. Yeah, <clears throat> we felt it. We so felt Danielle, it. can you tell us a little bit about your project, your anti-racism reaching out project? So everything's born out of necessity and also pain. So I was together on a Zoom call with four other Black women law deans. And we were really trying to nurse one another through the drafting of our various uh, letters to our communities. And I showed them a picture of a collage of the black men and women and children who were killed by police impunity. And I said, I can't get this, these pictures out of my head, which, which is why it's called pictures in my head because I transposed those pictures of those people who had been killed by police up against the 40 plus law deans who identify as black or African-American. And I said, but for the grace of God, Allah, your spirit, whomever you pray to, but for the grace of that, that could be us. And so, we said we have to do something about this. We have to stand up as, as 
Sandra said, we're in these positions. And so if we're in these positions, we are required to stand up and speak. And so the AALS Law Dean's Anti-Racist Clearinghouse Project was born out of that despair and the need to stand up in these positions of leadership. And I can tell you, I mean, it just came pouring out. We, we got that site up and running in less than two days. Really? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's, it's and, I've looked at some of the work there. Yeah. And it's, it's phenomenal. And it's a process, right? It's not just a list of solidarity statements. It's a process of listening, of learning, of leading, of auditing our institutions to see if we are active as anti-racist. And then the, one of the important last steps of that process is the iterative process to just do it all over again, because you don't just become anti-racist by saying it. No. You become it by action and constant vigilance. And it's all of us, all of us, even black people have tra been trained that institutional racism is a construct that we must operate in. Mm -hmm. And one has mm -hmm. to ask oneself, why? Why do I have to operate in a institution that is racist? So that's what it was born out of. Yeah. Wow, that's powerful. That's, I read some of the pieces that, there, that are included there and it's, I, I am, I am, I'm so pleased that first off that you are there and in that position one of the things that we talked about at the last session was you know the importance of diversity in the positions mm -hmm. um that make a difference in our society we talked about it from the perspective of um you know for 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 judges for uh for for those in the legal profession for Lord, that that perspective is so necessary for a society that is diverse um, because each of us brings, just like we talked about the different um, titles and places that you hold, each of us brings all of who we are to that position. Mm -hmm. And is, it is impossible to, I won't say it's, you can, you can certainly compartmentalize, but those perspectives and those viewpoints and those life experiences coupled with your with your education and training, mm -hmm. bring an entirely necessary perspective to all that we do as a society. And it's, that's the thing that's gonna make it so that we can bring our humanity to, to practice. Mm -hmm. And so we can do it there. I remember, this was years ago, one of the, uh, some of you, you probably remember him, Chief, Chief of Police Michael Nakamura. Um, and I knew him from many years. I was working with the city and I, the police department is one of the agencies I worked with at Corporation Council. And so I knew him from those days when he was not the chief. But here was a person who actually, at least to me, just from that experience, who brought that sense of the humanity to what mm -hmm. he did as chief of police. And I think those of you that got to know him, you kind of knew that. Mm -hmm. When he retired, um, <clears throat> one of the things that he used to do because he had, uh, uh, he came to a point where he was not able to walk and he was in a wheelchair. Mm -hmm. And so one of the things that he would do, and this is the chief of police and you knew who he was, retired chief of police, who's riding around on a scooter with a bouquet of roses mm. in downtown Honolulu along Bishop Street and if you saw someone that you know you knew, or maybe somebody he didn't know, to say hello and present them with the rose. Now he's in Bishop Street. Everybody, you know, this was wait, isn't that Chief Nakamura? We and know. <laughs> hello. But it was just his way of, you know, it was a person who cared, a person with demonstrating humanity from a place where uh, you know, he had obviously considerable authority and ability to carry out the work that he did as a, as, a, right. as a chief of police. But again, there was the humanity that he expressed in doing that. And it always, it always touched me. I was like, 
Mike, you can't do, do you can't keep just riding around giving out roses to people. People don't yes, you can. The police don't do that. You know? Yes, you can. <laughs> you know? But but again, I mean, I'm not minimizing, you know, the work mm -hmm. of police, but again, we're talking about the humanity that needs to be expressed in all that we do and understanding that we connect with each other because we are all connected in that way. Yeah. That's my two cents. So where do we go from here? There's so many ways to go from here. And that's what I'm excited to actually talk about. There is not one way to solve this problem. That's that in it itself is a strength. There are so many ways to come at this. There is educating ourselves, all of ourselves, right? One of the things I tell people is that in high school and middle school and uh, undergraduate school, I was never taught this history, right? I was fortunate I had great teachers who taught me other people's history, Ilie Wiesel, uh, uh, other important uh, writers and authors, Hannah Arendt. I was very fortunate. And I'm able to transfer that knowledge now with what I'm teaching myself about those who came before me. So the things that we can do are to really immerse ourselves in all people's origin stories. Again, something I learned in Hawaii, that being here 15 years and doing a Fulbright in Australia and in Aotearoa with the Maori, with the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, uh, with the, the people in Micronesia and Macronesia and everything I learned in Japan and China and Mongolia and keep going. Those were training grounds for me to learn about other people's origin stories. And then I was able to approach my own after learning about all of those other important stories. And so that's been the beauty of it. And we can, we can educate ourselves about so many histories. Yeah. I think yeah. those points, the essential, critical importance of putting diversity, equity, and inclusion at the front, at the foundation, honoring those, building on those, welcoming those. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think you're exactly right. The vulnerability and humanity connect mm -hmm. best when those elements, diversity, equity, and inclusion are served. Mm -hmm. As yeah, another I, phrase from I, a friend. It's absolutely, it's absolutely important. It's absolutely necessary. It's and just I, absolutely necessary. Yeah. And I really want to say the conduit of that came from the host culture, you know, being able to even learn that and accept that came from the immersion in the native Hawaiian culture. And that's not to romanticize it, but it's to say, these are, are people who are justice warriors. Yeah. <laughs> they have a lot to teach yeah. about learning your own history. And absolutely, thank well, goodness I had that exposure. And that's a really important point because I think it brings to mind a phrase a friend once shared that really registers now. He said, Chuck, what's the difference between humanity and equality? Mm. One vowel and a couple of consonants. Mm -hmm. We need to get past that. We need to see that those come from the same root. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Hey, and we need to do exactly what both of you are talking about, which is not to try and pretend we're a melting pot and we're all converging toward some model of sameness. It is exactly that diversity. Rep Replinger put it so well. Hawaii, the salad bowl. Daikon, cucumbers, cilantro, 
everything. Everything has a value and everything has a place. Mm -hmm. yeah. We need to learn to do exactly what you are talking about, which is to honor, exalt, cultivate, nurture that diversity, that equity, mm -hmm. that inclusion mm -hmm. in each of us and among us. Mm -hmm. How does your project, Danielle, propose to do that? So we propose to do it by first standing up and, and leading and understanding the power of our own voices. Mm -hmm. So we actually did do that. So many of our law dean colleagues were standing and writing in solidarity, but right. we, said, we said, hold on, <laughs> hold on. We're not doing this to see who writes the best letter about George Floyd's killing. We're doing this because we have humanity to save. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we needed our colleagues to listen to their Black Dean colleagues to first feel our pain. As we were talking earlier, there are so many ways to tap into that pain to begin to understand someone's journey. And so our, our colleagues listened to us. It was fabulous. They said, you're right. That's a first step. Acknowledgement that there is a pain and that pain is coming from irrational behavior called white supremacy, called white hierarchy. And that is not humanity. So that acknowledgement is the perfect place to start. And I think Absolutely. that's, yeah, Sandra. And I think we're seeing that kind of acknowledgement beginning, you know, with so much occurring around the country, so many incidents, it's starting with that. And I think there is this collective acknowledgement that there is a serious issue in this country, in this society, in this world that absolutely has to be addressed at its core. Mm -hmm. it, we cannot just put you know, icing on it and just cover it up and just, you know, do some reform kind of things. Mm -hmm. We are talking about the need to acknowledge what we have and then from there to begin structural change. Yeah. Yeah. Structural change, basically starting, some places starting all over again. And, and I'll acknowledging the humanity of all of us as we begin to rebuild. And, and I'll so, end with this statement, a faulty foundation will always collapse. Yeah. Thank absolutely. you both so much. It's a shame that we're out of time today, but we will continue this in a couple of weeks. And, yes. and let's leave us, we are joined at the heart and the hip in music as well. Let's leave this with a tribute and image to that incredible young 12 year old man who has shared his song and it's gone worldwide about exactly what you're talking about, joining humanity through our shared vulnerabilities and hope. Thank you both so much. Let's do this again. Aloha. Aloha. Take mahalo care. Chuck and mahalo Danya. It's good to see you both again. You as well.